virgin most powerful radio sharing the gospel with clarity and charity I'm a soldier for Christ. I'm a soldier for Christ. I'm a soldier. No, they'll never take us under. Because we're bringing truth like thunder. Raining on your speakers like a ton of bricks. Hold the cross high because we're Catholics. Fight the good fight with the truth. Stand tall with the truth. I'm a warrior for Christ. I'm in love with the truth. Love God. Save souls. Slay error. Go stronger. Holy hour of power. Two Catholics with a PhD in common sense. In fact, two retired L.A. cops. Uh, the Terry and Jesse show. Terry's out doing some apostolic work today. And I got my partner here, Ruben Nava. Uh, we worked in the L.A. Sheriff's Department together. We're both retired from the department. Ruben, welcome on board. Uh, good to be here, Jess. Uh, people who who don't know me, uh, I'm your co-host on Jesus 911. So, That's right. Uh, I do a podcast with Ruben earlier in the day. Uh, two other... Uh, Officers retired. Eddie Chavez, Ruben, we do a podcast called Jesus 911 and uh, talk about muscular Christianity, spiritual warfare, things that really interest men. So if you want to check out that podcast, you can do so by going to vmpr.org. Hey, we want to talk about, as we start off the first segment on the Terry and Jesse show, we always talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And today's gospel, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18 is very powerful. After I read it, I'll tell you why it's very powerful Then I want to get Ruben's comments on it. Or you want me to read it, Jess, and you comment? Yeah, Ruben, okay. you know, go ahead and read it. Okay. If I can say my voice, and you know, I can make some comments. Go. Okay. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through Him. Without Him, nothing came to be. And what came to be through Him was life. And this life was the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. A man named John was sent from God. He came to afford testimony, to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came to be through him. But the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, but his own people did not accept him. But to those who did accept, he gave power to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were, not, who were born not by natural generation, nor by human choice, nor by a man's decision, but by God. Verse 14 says, Et verbum caro factum es, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we saw his glory, the glory of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, The one who is coming after me ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. From his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace, because while the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only Son of God, who was at the Father's side, has revealed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise uh, you, Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Whoa, a lot of meat potatoes there to start off the show. First That's of all, I want to say that this reading is feared by is is feared by demons. Why do I say that? <clears throat> John chapter one, verses one to fourteen. I know it was Reuben read to eighteen today's mass reading, but from verses one to fourteen, this is the the first Bible verse that's used in an exorcism, in a solemn exorcism. In the book that a priest uses calls the rite of exorcism, he, as he prays, there are several Bible passages, Bible verses within the rite. This is the first one that's in the rite. And it's the most effective one. If you've probably seen maybe little sound bites of the movie, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, you have that priest, in, in the movie, that's what he was doing over Emily Rose. He was praying John chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. He was praying the rite of exorcism. One of the things that I, I've seen, well, I've, I've talked to several priests in spiritual warfare around the country, and they've said that 
there's a rise in satanic activity. Nobody denies that. And one of the things that's weakened our church as there's a rise in Satanism and the church has been weakened in so far as at the end of the Latin Mass before 1962, the priests, even in the low Mass, they, they read John chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. Then they'll pray the Memorari. Then they'll pray three Hail Marys. Then they'll pray the St. Michael the Archangel prayer. All that's been taken out of the Novus Ordo Mass. Now you can still, I do that on my own, but most people are talking and chit-chatting and walking out. Right. These three prayers that were taken out, let me tell you the effect of them. Number one, John 1, verses 1 to 14, at the end of the Latin Mass, that's the most powerful exorcism prayer in the New Testament against a demon. And so the priest was praying that over the congregation before we left. Secondly, the three Hail Marys that were prayed after the Latin Mass that uh, are, were basically taken away after, 19, after 1970, <clears throat> the three Hail Marys, there's a, there's a promise attached by Our Lady in many approved Marian apparitions, approved, where she says that if you pray three Hail Marys in the morning and in the evening, she'll protect you from mortal sin and from the diabolical. Also, what was removed after the Latin Mass was the St. Michael the Archangel prayer. Now, a lot of parishes, Novus Ordo parishes, are starting to do it now because a lot of bishops are seeing that there is a rise in satanic activity. So different bishops, and even different, like my pastor, he does it after every Mass. So it's starting to come back, thanks be to God, but it never should have been taken out. No. Because again, these are prayers to protect lay people from the diabolical. And then finally... At the end of the mass, we also prayed the uh, the uh, the memorari, uh, and that was uh, that was also removed. And so, the the fact is, John chapter one verses one to fourteen is a powerful gospel used in the rite of exorcism. That's the first uh, Bible verse deployed in the rite, and it's very effective. And I'll tell you something else. On an apologetic standpoint, in the first uh, two chapter, two verses, do not use a Jehovah's Witnesses Bible and concede to read their Bible because they manipulated many verses to try to uh, demythologize who Jesus is. For example, in every Catholic and Protestant Bible, it reads the same right from the Greek where it says, in the beginning was the Word. Think about Word. Word is the Logos. That's the second person of the Trinity. It's Jesus incarnate. So we'll just say Jesus so you can understand it, okay? So it'll say, in the beginning was the Jesus, and the Jesus was with God, and the Jesus was God. That's the, wor- the word is a reference to the second person of the Trinity. The Jehovah's Witnesses have changed that verse, and this is how they get low information Catholics. They say, hey, you guys have been teaching that Jesus is God. You guys are wrong. So a Catholic that doesn't read their Bible will say, really? I didn't know. I thought he was God. Oh, no, he's not. They'll say, so they'll take you to their Bible, and what they've done on verse 1, they've inserted a preposition that's not in any Greek manuscript. So the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible says, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. So they inserted the preposition a in the New World Translation, it's not found in any Catholic translation, any Protestant translation, or in the original Greek manuscripts. So I just say that just to alert Catholics, do not use a Jehovah's Witnesses Bible. That's one of a hundred verses that's been changed. And the last thing, that that two more things that jump out at me, Ruben, that just make me very, uh, give me a lot of hope. The verse where it says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That light is Jesus. That's right. It doesn't matter what time we're living in, or it doesn't matter communism, socialism, you know, terrorism. Don't don't let all that stuff get you down. Keep reminding yourself the light shines in the darkness. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. He shines in this darkness, and we're gonna win because he's already won on Calvary. And the last thing that jumps out at me is uh where it says that Jesus Christ, it says, and the word became flesh, verse 14, and made his dwelling among us. That's only fulfilled in Catholic churches. 
the word dwelling is the Hebrew word tabernacle. Right. Well, guess what? Verse 14 is literally fulfilled in Catholic churches and, to be honest, Orthodox churches that have a tabernacle. God is dwelling there in those tabernacles. Verse 14 is being fulfilled only in those two churches, the Catholics and the Orthodox. And I like the way verse 14 says, it says, We saw his glory, the glory as as the Father's only begotten Son, full of grace and truth. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus is full of grace and truth. Guess what? There's only one other person called full of grace in the Bible, mm-hmm. Mary. Luke right. one twenty six, Mary's called full of grace. John one fourteen, Jesus is called full of grace. Now, now you see why we as Catholics we don't separate the Son from the Mother. Amen. Ruben? Amen. You comments? know what really strikes out strikes me is uh, the the evangelist John. He immediately captures the reader's attention um, with the startling disclosure that the Palestinian man, um, you know. The Palestinian rabbi who died an ignominious death some 30 to 60 years earlier is in fact the God of Israel and the creator of the universe. And then the apostle Bible. goes on. He goes on to to um, introduce the, the greatest of the, the, the last prophet, the greatest of the prophets, as Jesus says, John the Baptist. He introduces him. You know, so I think that's just, it's really cool to 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 realize that. And it and that he John um shows that it's it was anticipated in Hebrew scriptures and fo- foretold by the prophets. So I think that's this is a powerful uh, gospel. And uh, this was, in the extraordinary right, this was the gospel we read at Christmas. Oh, okay. The gospel for Christmas, yes. Got it. Ruben, you know what? Right. When I was in Israel, I've been there twice. I know you've been there uh, as well. Yes. When I was in Israel, I looked at that land and I said, wow, God walked on this. Yep. Amen. We'll be back up next. We're going to be talking about marijuana uh you don't want to miss uh, some of the comments we're going to be making brothers and sisters in christ this is jesse romero join me on a pilgrimage of faith and discovery to poland for the 100th year anniversary of the birth of saint john paul ii in may of 2020 Together we'll experience the faith, beauty, and culture of Poland and become imbibed with the spirit of John Paul II. We'll visit the town of Wadawisi, where John Paul was born, and the city of Krakow, where he was ordained and later became bishop. We'll also travel to Jasnagora and visit Our Lady of Czestochowa, and we'll have a chance to venerate the original image of the merciful Jesus at St. Faustina's convent and the city that St. Maximilian Kolbe built for the Immaculata. Finally, we'll pay a visit to Auschwitz, where St. Maximilian Kolbe was martyred. This is the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to worship and discover your own faith at places where St. John Paul II grew in his own love for our Lord. For more information or how to join this pilgrimage, visit my website at jesseromero.com. Jesus said to the apostles in Luke chapter 10, Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me. According to St. Boniface, in her voyage across the ocean of this world, the church is like a great ship being pounded by the waves of life's different stresses. Our duty is not to abandon ship, but to keep her on course. May our Lord help us remain ever faithful to his church to aid and defend her. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877-543-3871, because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Now, here's Terry and Jesse. 
Terry and Jesse show. Terry's out doing some apostolic work. He'll be back next year. Got my partner, Ruben Nava, retired Los Angeles uh, sergeant. Uh, worked for over 30 years in the department. He's uh, filling in today. We do a program together. It's called Jesus 911. And uh, yes. it's podcasted a little bit earlier. It's a Monday through Friday show I do with two uh, retired cops. So you may want to check that out by going to vmpr.org. Ruben, California... I think they're trying to reboot their their entire economy uh, through the, through the vice of marijuana. I mean, uh, they're just basically throwing throwing all their ores in the water here. From this article that I'm reading, it says California cannabis industry sending SOS to state leaders. But what they didn't anticipate was the black market. Yeah, but California, these investors are saying, "Okay, man, we're going to make umpteen amounts of billions of dollars by 2020." Wow, this is going to be the greatest thing since wine in California. And now all of a sudden, they're saying, uh-oh, we didn't realize we're competing out with the black market, yeah. and they're undercutting us. Ruben, what do you think about this article? You know, that we predicted we could have uh, predicted that because when, when this was, law was being proposed, and I was with the sheriff's department, and I was working narcotics. So the last eight years of my career was with uh, the narcotics unit. And so we were trying to get the word out to the, the voters that this is a bad, uh, a bad thing. We can't allow this to, to pass. And obviously we lost. And, uh, but we were saying that's only going to increase the black market sales. And uh, they said, Oh no, that was your argument, right? Uh, yeah. It's going to increase it because we had already saw that. That's what would happen in Colorado. And that's what happened in Washington because now there, there's uh you know, they kind of move, the the uh, black market they move under the you know this blanket of legalism you know this legal uh, the things that are okay to do so it kind of gets it's like a little um, covered over if you will and it's not a a lot of times you know it's not easy this, to cast these guys anymore because of again because of the permissive laws right that yeah and then and also because now law enforcement they're they're a lot of them are just throwing their hands up and saying hey man you this is legal. They just they we let, lost this they, fight. They load. They let it go. You know. So uh, there's very little uh, time being spent in jail. And and the, the and in fact, the, we found that the the district attorneys were um, fearful. They didn't know how to prosecute these things, especially when we were take down a uh, an illegal uh, marijuana shop. You know, they, they well they they were just we had so many that were backed up. And not anything being done to these places. And uh, well, Ruben, look, uh, I want to back up what you're saying. So, in the article, it says this uh, about kind of what you're saying about these shops. California cannabis businesses have that have cut their workforces or scaled back growth plans say their woe their woes aren't limited to aren't limited to the capital markets turbulence and the growing pains ricocheting through their broader cannabis industry. Their challenges, they say, are homegrown. Here it is. California has too few licensed cannabis businesses, too much tax sta- taxation, and overly onerous regulation. So in other words, <clears throat> the crooks, Ruben, they're not going to abide by the law. No. They're going to say, you know what? There's too much regulation, but it is legal. And so they're not going to make a big thing about it. We're not going to get whatever licenses we need. We're not going to pay all these taxes and it's because it's kind of like jaywalking. People just, cops just kind of like, you know, turned a blind eye to it. And so this is, you have, you probably have a lot of money, it says here, that is being poured in from now the cigarette industry. You got the cigarette people saying, well, they basically destroyed our industry. Let's dump our money, whatever we have left into this marijuana stuff. And uh, and again, there's a big black market and there's just not a lot of law enforcement being provided uh, for checks and balances. Am I right? That's right. And yeah, because the the law is forcing these um, legal, the permissive uh, laws. The, per, yeah, they're 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 forcing them to to do a lot of um, research and a lot of um, you know testing, and so that they they can meet certain standards. But in the black market, there's no standards. You know, you don't know what you're getting and how you're getting it, what how it's made, where it's you know if they're putting any. Uh, fertilizers that uh, are toxic which they do by the way you know there's a there's a whole lot of uh, th- 
friends of mine who were doing the eradication up in the, the in the mountains in the hills they uh they would come across these big elaborate uh groves and uh, of course they'd come in and they'd they chop them down and and the helicopter would come in and they they'd bundle them up and and the helicopters would take you know hundreds of pounds of of these plants away but then they they find a ton of uh pesticides and and things and poisons to to ward off the animals that might come to eat their their harvest you know so these things are getting into the plants they're getting into the the marijuana that people are consuming and so you know there's there's people that are getting sick and uh, yeah to back you up in the article about getting sick here's what it says it's a uh, quoting this guy named Dennis Hunter co-founder of Canacraft a seed to shelf producer of sun grown cannabis he said that he recently laid off 20% of his 240 person workforce because of the black markets undercutting him. And he also says, Hunter says this, they didn't realize how strong this illicit market was going to stay. I think people really thought that it was going to stop after legalization. And actually the opposite has happened. It almost feels like the illicit market is getting stronger. An entrenched black market creates more than just headaches for licensed operators. It, it is also a potential public health issue, said Jane, Jake Highmark, co-founder of CEO of CBD Edibles, who compared it to the recent illnesses and deaths linked to illicit vaping devices. He says, I'm hoping the state will step in and take some action to correct some of this. If we don't solve it here in California, I think it's difficult to make a case for a national rollout. In other words, the, the left wants us to be national. So they're looking at California and Colorado as Washington. Kind of like, all right, here's a template. Is it working? Let's go national with this. And these guys are saying, these guys that are involved in the business are saying, you know what, it's a disaster right now. You got the black market, which we know the, what the black market is. It's the cartels. Yeah. yeah. It's the cartels and, and, and the Mexican mafia and the gangs. Uh, the, the, it's the, you know, the that... Hell's Angels, that, that's the black market. They're undercutting uh, the people that are trying to, to follow these, you know, the regulations and trying to get all their licenses and pay, pay all their stuff. Ruben, he, the long and the short of it is that this whole marijuana, here's my, in one sentence, the whole marijuana craze in California, Washington, and uh, Colorado, this is a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's what it is. They're, they're passing it off like, this is good. It's a sheep. No, it's a wolf. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, just like in the past, we saw the tobacco industry that they were reaping enormous profits and they were denying for years, ah, cigarettes don't harm you, cigarettes don't harm you. Well, guess what? The truth finally came out, virtually destroyed that business, and that's what's going to happen here. History is going to repeat itself. These guys, the, the whole marijuana lobby, they're saying, oh, Nothing to see here. This stuff doesn't harm you. Doesn't harm you. You know what? It's uh, it's medicine. Same thing's going to happen like happened with cigarettes. The cigarette industry for decades, you know, using you know billboards and, and commercials and promoting this. Then all of a sudden the science came in and even uh, the uh, general uh, surgeon general started saying, now you got to put this on your label. That this is dangerous. Mm-hmm. And it virtually, de- the, the facts destroyed the cigarette business. That's what's going to happen here because the facts are against them. In fact, Jesse, the the carcinogens are even higher when you're smoking marijuana than than cigarettes. And uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, problems in the future. You know, we had uh, what's his, the doctor's name that we uh, we we both know that um, Doctor Vince Fortinace. Vince Fortinace, brain surgeon. Yeah, and he says that there's a, a correlation between. You know, extended use or uh, a lot of use of this of uh, marijuana, smoking marijuana for you know, many years, and what it does to the brain, the, the the hippocampus of the brain. Because if you look at studies of the brain, it they look much like people with Alzheimer's, people who smoke marijuana for many years, it, it, their brain starts shrinking, and so yep. you're going to see these people with mental illnesses. Um, as they get older in life and we're going to, and now California is going to have to be spending a lot of money, keeping these people, you know, um, medicated and, and, yeah, and Ruben, I just, I just 
uh, heard a report. Uh, 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 it was uh, from Bill O'Reilly. He puts out a he puts out a short little daily report. He, he's a he's one of those guys that really facts check stuff. He says that eighty percent of the homeless population is uh, has medical marijuana cards. Eighty yeah. percent of the homeless population in California is a card carrying uh, cannabis user. Yeah. Do you think there's a connection? I, I, I read another doctor who says, uh, Dr. Richard Fitzgibbons, he says what marijuana does, it, it, he goes, it destroys your motivation. It destroys yeah. your drive. Right. It destroys your incentive. You become it, it, lazy. It, That's what it is. Yeah, there you go. It's a disincentive drug. By the way, I wrote a book on this. It's called uh, What's Wrong with Marijuana? 50 Questions and Answers. And Ruben actually endorsed the book. He was working narcotics at the time. And I go through a lot of these arguments as well. But for a Catholic, here's what I would just say very simple for a Catholic. Okay? Why is marijuana wrong for a Catholic? I'll just make it simple. Because I'll, I'll, just, I'll make St. Thomas Aquinas simple for dummies. And because marijuana alters your mind, it alters your judgment, it alters your ability to think clearly and sturdy. Okay? That's basic Thomistic philosophy. Now, law enforcement, well, why would I say it's wrong? I've got a study in my book that says 85% of guys that are locked up in California, 85% committed their crime under the influence of drugs, alcohol, or a combination of both. And when you talk to them, they said, I never would have committed the crime that I committed had I not been under the influence. There's only one reason for this whole medical marijuana craze. It's it's so that people, it's, it's, and it's just because... People have a hard time dealing with reality. Mm -hmm. So what does God want from us? God wants us to live a life of sobriety. It's all over the Bible. Be sober. Life of sobriety. And and God wants us to have what I would call a Marian spirituality. That means be it done unto me according to thy word. That's a Marian spirituality. What does the devil want from us? He wants us to have a marijuana spirituality. See the difference? God wants us to have a Marian spirituality. The devil wants us to have a marijuana spirituality. Marijuana spirituality is live a life of intoxication and do what you do it do whatever you feel like doing. Right. Follow your own will, and that's what uh, these these uh, bad laws are leading people in California to do. And the streets are piling on with more and more homeless people that have marijuana spirituality and are following their own disordered passions. Yeah, just I, when I read these these people, these uh, people, growers and distributors that are crying for more restrictive laws on on the black market, I just it's like the Charlie Brown teacher. <laughs> wah 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 wah. <laughs> Cry me a river, come on, man. I have no sympathy for them. Hey, we're gonna talk about the Eucharist next. All right. Welcome to our January 11, 2020 Spiritual Warfare Conference. Every year without fail, this is our most popular, well-attended event. This year's Spiritual Warfare Conference will host Adam Bly, a Catholic demonologist, and an auxiliary member of the International Association of Exorcists, along with Dr. Luis Sandoval, a psychiatrist who's part of the Healing, Deliverance, and Exorcism team for the Diocese of Orange. These two gentlemen bring tons of experience and expertise in the area of spiritual warfare. This is going to be a high-information Catholic seminar. I'll be there as well, sharing some riveting stories on the diabolical and liberation found through Jesus Christ from my best-selling book, The Devil in the City of Angels. Mark your calendars, come and join us, and meet other radio hosts from Jesus 911. Contrary to popular belief, spiritual warfare is not demon-centered. It's Christ-centered. Come join us and learn how to armor up and fight the good fight of faith. Catholics, wake up. Don't hit the snooze button. Join us at St. Christopher Catholic Church, 629 South Glendora Avenue, West Covina, California, on January 11, 2020. See you then. Strength and honor in Jesus' name. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, 
A portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year-round. May God bless you and your family. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877-543-3871, because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Now, here's Terry and Jesse. The Terry and Jesse Show. I got my partner, Ruben Nava, retired sergeant from the L.A. Sheriff's Department, uh, worked narcotics his last couple of years, so he's the perfect guy for today's show in regards to the topic that we just had. I want to thank all of you out there listening to us on stations of the Cross Radio all over the East Coast. There's some major markets out there. You know, today's the last day where you can get a tax write-off for giving to, you know, and that, heck, that's what me and my wife did. Mm. Me and my wife got our checkbook. We said, okay, who are we going to uh, give some money to this uh, year? We're looking around some good apostolates that are feeding us, and we wrote some nice checks. Mm-hmm. There's some of you guys that are blessed uh, with good jobs, good money, good retirement. Uh, it's, it's the end of the year. Stations of the Cross, those of you that are getting fed by Stations of the Cross radio, uh, keep this thing going. Keep it on the air. Write them a nice, sizable check. Get a tax write-off. You know, I tell people that uh, Stations of the Cross Radio is like a big refrigerator, okay? Mm-hmm. And sometimes the food's starting to go down, and that's why we need some donations so we can stock the refrigerator with some more with some more provisions so we can keep uh, using Stations of the Cross Radio and the airwaves and their transmitters to proclaim the Catholic gospel. So, hey, the year-end uh, today's the end of the year. Think about donating to Stations of the Cross so you can keep hearing quality programs just like this one and many others. Ruben, let's talk about well the importance of receiving the Holy Eucharist. This Ruben, is it right here. This is it. This is the yep. most important topic we can think about today. Christmas provides a, a wonderful time to teach the faithful anew the sublime nature of the Holy Eucharist, that Jesus Christ became a man not simply to save the world, as in, it says in Luke uh, two ten to eleven, as the Messiah King Matthew two, but also as, that we could become children of God, beginning in baptism and in an ongoing and ever deepening manner through reception of our Lord's body, blood, soul, and divinity in Holy Communion. Amen. Um, we receive Jesus under the appearances of bread and wine at Mass, a reality hinted at in Matthew's Gospel in the infancy narrative. For our Lord is born in Bethlehem. Uh, Matthew 2, which means house of bread. In addition, his blessed mother laid him in a manger. Manger in French means a bread trough, you know, um, which normally serves as a place from which animals feed. But here indicates, as Scripture later affirms, that Jesus would serve as a genuine consumptive sustenance for our follow for his followers. As you can see, John chapter 6, verses 51 to 58. Ruben, so the careful, the anybody who's carefully reading Scripture, they can see just based on the three verses that you quoted, Matthew 2, Luke 2, John 6, that Jesus came to planet Earth as not only the God-man, but he also came to continue that humiliation by making himself, if you will, a sacred meal that we call the Holy Eucharist. And everything about the infancy narrative tells us that God became a man who now became, who becomes our sacred Passover meal that St. Paul calls Jesus in, in first of uh, Corinthians five, seven and, and, and all this about the manger and the name of Bethlehem. He came so that we can consume him. Right. Just spent- and only Catholics and Orthodox get that. Ruben. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, um, having spent years doing some bodybuilding, um, you know, we're always talking about you are what you eat. Well, mm-hmm. here, our spiritual food is Jesus. You you become 
more and more like him, the more you consume him, you know, obviously in a state of grace, you know, with the right disposition. So uh, this is a sad fact that uh, given that 21 percent of uh, U.S. Catholics participate in in Sunday Mass, that's only 21 percent. And just one third to one half believe in the real presence. The fact that Chris that Christmas masses draw the biggest crowds annually, pastors and other priests should use Christmas worship as an opportunity to emphasize that the mass is the source and summit of the Christian life, as it's stated in the Catechism thirteen twenty four. And that as Jesus teaches, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. John six fifty four. Uh, but are we prepared to receive Jesus so profitably in Holy Communion? Jesus also teaches we must keep his commandments to be his disciples. In John 8, 31 and 14, 21, which, and St. Paul adds, you know, um, not receive, to include not receiving our Eucharistic Lord in an unworthy manner. That's I, the big one right there, Reuben. That's, that's right. the big one right there. I.e., in a state of mortal sin, lest we be guilty of profaning the body and blood of our Lord. So, um, you know, it's, it's true that we cannot, we cannot go and receive in an unworthy man, manner. And what the, the article is, is stressing is that this is the perfect time for the pastor of the, of the, to, to really emphasize that because so many people are going to be coming prancing forward that maybe have, you know, they, they're Christer, um, Catholics. They go to mass on Christmas and Easter so that, you know, they haven't been to com- confession, but yet they're going to come up because they're one of the 66% who no longer believe, you know, in, in, in Jesus in the Eucharist. They feel like uh, it's just a, it's just a, a symbol. So they're going gonna... to... And I, and I want to give a big kudos and props to this priest called Father Scott Nolan. Okay. Because what he did a couple of weeks ago, he really stepped out of his comfort zone, okay? He saw... Uh, Judge Sarah Smolensky, yes, a, a district court judge in Michigan. I, I believe, as as I recall, she's a she's a, she's a living in, in a lesbian marriage. relationship, a same sex right? marriage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. So, uh, and, and he talked to her in private mm-hmm. about not being able to come to receive communion because, again, she had, she had legally legally contracted a same sex marriage because of these unjust, wacky laws being pushed by the left. And it took a lot of guts to do that because this judge, yeah. she used her media influence and she took it to the press. Yeah. And she was trying, of course, you know, demonize him through the press. He fought back. You know what? He he stood his ground. So God bless you, Father Scott Nolan. We need a, a lot of priests like you with that type of courage that would love your parishioners so much that you would tell her exactly what the church says. Because it's like what you just read, Ruben. Uh if you receive the Holy Eucharist, which is Jesus himself, in an unworthy manner, you're you're profaning the body and blood of the Lord, and you're drinking, eating and drinking judgment to yourself. That a, a priest approaching somebody who he knows is in grave mortal sin is an act of charity, not an act of judgment. Yeah. You know, it's, um, she said that this judge said, that, how come all these other priests everywhere, good and decent, wonderful priests... They know me and they give me communion. So it reminds me, it reminds me of the driver who told me, why did you stop me for speeding? There were others that were going just as fast. That's when you look at them right in the eye and you say, I didn't see them <laughs> or, or I could only stop one of you. And so today's your lucky day. License and registration, please. <laughs> yeah. That, that's unfortunate that those priests uh, we're we're still giving her communion because they're they're making her her soul even more uh, in a state of uh, peril. Yeah, the, mm-hmm. Exactly, the, and actually they're cooperating. Like the catechism says, there's nine ways to cooperate in somebody else's sin. Yeah. And if a priest knows that one of his parishioners, I mean, if they, the town mayor or the governor, if a priest knows they're in living in mortal sin mm-hmm. and they they obstinately refuse to. to submit to the church's teachings and they're giving them Holy communion. Uh, they're participating in their sin. I'll give, I'll give according an, to the catechism. I'll give you another analogy just um, from law enforcement, you know, because it's, it says in the article, indeed a good shepherd always looks out for the spiritual welfare of his flock. And, you know, so just as a good police officer or deputy sheriff is obliged to take care of 
of any prisoner in his custody. That's why we get chewed out if we roll to a hot call. Do you remember, Jess? We rolled with a to, with a prisoner in our back seat. We, yeah. <laughs> it's, no, what are you no. doing? What are you thinking? You know, um, because we're responsible for those those people in our custody. A priest is, is more so obliged to care mm. for the prisoners in his custody. I say prisoners because when one's in mortal sin, Jess, he's in bondage. He's in custody. As they say on the streets, he's in the condado, or he's in the pinta. <laughs> As they say, that's all they, that's they the say. The county or prison. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we have to take care of our those in our custody, and more so the priests. Absolutely. And uh, the article says, for those not prepared to receive the Eucharist, looking out for them always includes inviting them to make a spiritual communion at Mass. That's a beautiful prayer. That you know. Uh, the spiritual communion prayer. Yes, it, it's you can hear at the end of. They play it every day on EWTN during during the communion service. Uh, it, it's a it's a prayer where you're making spiritual communion with Jesus, because you realize or you acknowledge that you can't receive him sacramentally. I heard one of the saints. He they said, making sacramental communion with Jesus is like giving Jesus gold, a brick of gold. Mm-hmm. Making spiritual communion with Jesus is like giving Jesus silver. Both are beautiful. Both are precious metals. Gold is is more precious than silver. But nonetheless, if you're in a situation where you know right now you can't receive Holy Communion, don't stop from going to Mass and kneeling right there and making spirit, giving Jesus your heart at Mass right there. And he sees that you long, you have that desire to receive him one day sacramentally. He's going to honor that. He's going to honor that sacrifice. Ruben? Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, <clears throat> Cyprian of Carthage, he says, uh, talking about taking communion in an unworthy manner, he says that uh, before, if they take it before com- confession has been made of their crime, before their conscience has been purged by sacrifice and by the hand of the priest, before the offense of an angry and threatening Lord has been appeased, and so violence is done to his body and blood, and they sin now against their Lord more than their hand and mouth than when they denied their Lord. So it's it's an even greater offense is what, what he's saying. And that, that's taken from the, uh, uh, where he, ra- he writes in AD 251. From, uh, yeah, because re- receiving in an unworthy manner is a mortal sin. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven to 30. Okay? Yes, yes. Then you compound it with another mortal sin is called sacrilege. Sacrilege is like one of the worst mortal sins. Yes. Because it's an offense against divine things. So you've compounded your problems by by adding not only to the mortal sin that you're in, but then now sacrilege against the most holy thing on planet Earth, the Holy Eucharist. So priest Hey, don't forget, make right. your end of year pledge to Stations of the Cross. One more day to uh, to support this uh, great radio network. We'll be right back. This is Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio. This March, VMPR, in association with the Catholic Resource Center, will be hosting a special conference for the Adoramus Society. Adoramus at the Triduum, a conference on the spirituality of the Triduum liturgies, featuring Father Joseph Fessio, Dr. Anthony Lillis, and Christopher Karstens, addressing such topics as developing a liturgical spirituality, the spirituality of Holy Thursday, the spirituality of Good Friday, and the spirituality of the Paschal Vigil and Easter season. It all takes place March 14th, 2020 at the historic Sacred Heart Chapel at 381 West Center Street, Covina, California, 91723. You can register online at vmpr.org or call now 877-526-2151 to reserve your seat today for Adoramus at the Triduum. Jesus said in Luke 17, When you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have only done our duty. According to St. John of the Cross, God is pleased with the little deeds we do in secret. 
He takes more pleasure in these than in a multitude of grand works that we may do out of the desire to be seen by others. May God help us to do the things that please Him and not just to appear great in the eyes of others. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877-543-3871, because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Now, here's Terry and Jesse. We're wrapping up another year. You know, every year that every year that closes, I just say we're closer to the second coming of Christ. Two things. We're either closer to Judgment Day, the second coming of Christ, or B, you're closer to your particular judgment. So every year that closes, We've all got an exit interview with That's Jesus. Right. That's right. Which is why, this for this year end, any of you that are benefiting from Stations of the Cross, think about writing them a nice, sizable check. Stations of the Cross, uh, they cover some major markets over in the East Coast, and there's so many people that are benefiting from the the very sound Catholic teachings that are coming out out of this network 24 hours a day, and uh, we thank them for carrying the Terry and Jesse show. Uh, but uh, I just want to encourage you to support good apostolists like Stations of the Cross. I know some of you guys are blessed. The economy's good. Come on. Let's just be honest. Yes. We haven't had a, an economy like this in over 50 years. Everybody has a little bit of extra money in their pocket. And uh, tax seasons are in a couple of months. You know what? Uh, give yourself, Instead of giving all this money to Uncle Sam, give it to somebody worthy like Stations of the Cross Radio. Hey, Ruben, let's talk a little bit about... Uh, Catholic New Year's resolutions. Let's do it. That's all right. Today's the last day of the decade, and uh, so we want to ring in the new year with uh, with a bang, with a, a holy new year. That's that's right. Yeah. So uh, there's some things here that we can uh, we can follow to have a holy new year, and uh, the first one, and we'll just kind of go through it. Uh, yeah. First one is this: I will pray for peace with and or for my children and grandchildren every day at home and weekly at church because prayer changes things. That's important. We forget as Catholics that, um, especially those of us that are elders, you know, the next generation, uh, we have to be praying for them. And that's called intercessory prayer. And the prayer of a father over those children is very powerful, very powerful. Here's the second thing we could do to do to do the, the best New Year's resolution and for holiness in this upcoming year, okay? Since I'm a Catholic, I'm going to obey the Queen of Peace and Our Lady of Fatima, and I'm going to resolve in 2020 to pray the rosary for peace every day and also pray the rosary for the upcoming elections that we continue with this pro-life administration. And let's not forget that Jesus Christ. Uh, through the rosary, he can heal me and he can change my sinful ways as well. So there's not only a benefit for those you're praying for, you also receive a pers- personal benefit from our Lord and Our Lady by the daily rosary. That's right. The next one is, if I am a follower of the Prince of Pre- Peace, then I will attend Holy Mass every Sunday and on the Holy Day's obligation. And I'll add, and if you can make it during the week, add a- additional Masses throughout the week and receive Holy a Eucharist in a state of grace. I will go to the sacrament of confession frequently because um, if you're not in a state of grace, your, your prayers are bouncing off the walls. I mean, we have, we have, we, they're not efficacious. As if you're, uh, you're not in a state of grace, you, you have to, you want to change the world, change the, your family. You stay in a state of grace. That's right. Here's the fourth thing that we should, a good resolution for Catholics for New Year's. Start reading the Bible every day, okay? At least at least a chapter, or I'll make it simple. 
you could follow the mass readings. Okay, you could get them on your cell phone, and and uh, and you can go through the mass readings every day. First reading Psalm and a Gospel it takes five to seven minutes, and uh, and you're going to see the way during moments of temptation in your life your mind is going to recall something you read from Scripture, and you're going to say, ah, okay. Yeah, the Bible says, uh, he who lives in me is greater than he who lives in the world. Yeah, why am I afraid right now? Why am I afraid? So read the Bible. In fact, the Bible is actually called, reading the Word of God is called the sword of the Spirit in Ephesians 6, 17. So that reading the Bible is an offensive weapon. It's going to really uh, sharpen you up as a soldier of Christ. Yes. And so uh, the fifth point is I will visit, get involved in the pro-life movement in my parish and diocese. And I'm going to add that uh, I'm going to be joining the Knights of Columbus at my parish, Jess. I've been holding off. and but Awesome. Can't, can't hold off anymore, and they're very pro-life there, too. At the, yeah, the, yeah. I will help others to pray with their children and their families and their friends so that we may defeat the culture of death peacefully through the power of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, which always work when all else fails. Jesus told us to pray deliverance prayers, but this kind cannot be cast out except by prayer and fasting, Matthew seventeen twenty. So it's a Here's the sixth thing that we can do for this New Year's, okay? Read holy books. Quit reading Harry Potter trash mm-hmm. or other trashy novels, romance novels. Quit reading trashy magazines and other secular publications that waste your time and that provide useless entertainment, okay? Read good spiritual. Re- there's this. Oh, there's so much out there. Along with the Bible, cut your teeth on, uh, and and read from good Catholic authors. Not not goofballs that that we know. You know, uh, that are not teaching the Catholic faith. I don't want to mention any names right now because I don't want to depress myself. But you know the ones out there, mo- the modernists that are teaching uh, heterodox teachings. And also, you can start read. Just start reading the Catechism. Okay, start reading the Catechism. Or here's a simpler one. I got it right next to me. I got the Baltimore Catechism. Yep. That's a simple. It's about three quarters of an inch. Questions and answers. It's just a good primer so that you can get like the, like the brass tax basics of the faith. But start reading good spiritual holy books. Yep. Okay. Seventh point says, I will try to eliminate most television viewing from my life. For it wastes my time and teaches secular, worldly, trashy values, and most television viewing destroys virtue in children and adults. So quit watching the Kardashians. You know, <laughs> you don't need to. Just fill yourself with holy, holy uh, programs. If you're going to watch TV, you know, then watch something that's going to uplift you. You know, exactly. Uh, it, it's a uh, the, the the television is is a neutral object. It's not evil per se. It's how you use it. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you. I use my television. Nothing but good stuff comes out whenever I turn it on. I make sure I'm I'm watching something edifying that's going to build up either my faith or build me up in virtue or build me up in some type of knowledge that I have to know uh, so I can know how to vote properly. Correct. But yeah, use the tel use the television. Don't let the television use you. That's the point that we're making. Here's point number eight. A good thing to do for New Year's as Catholics: pray for your priest. Amen. Your pastor, the priest in your diocese, pray for your bishop. Pray for those in ministry, deacons, clergy, and religious, especially the ones that affect you in your life, because remember, they're the main target of Satan and his demons. And also, pray for the Pope every day. Okay? Yes. Yeah, I was going to say pray that. for the Pope every day. Got to pray for the Pope. Yep. Um, Number nine, I will take better care of my body and the bodies of my family, for the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17 says. I will try to understand that good, sensible, moderate nutrition is virtuous, and it helps to defeat the deadly sin of gluttony. Hmm, I wonder why I had to read that one. <laughs> Don't say nothing. We all Hector. wrestle with it, yeah. that's why. <laughs> that's right. And here's number 10. <clears throat> I'll try to understand that the seven deadly sins, which are pride, envy, lust, covetousness, anger, sloth, and gluttony, are the main reasons for all the sinfulness in the world, in our country, in our cities, and in our families. Mm-hmm. So how do, we, how do we slay these seven deadly sins? Well, 
a Catholic should allow. It's good to have a manger scene like we had for Christmas. And by the way, I think we're in the seventh day of the Christmas octave. We celebrate for eight days uh, the, the, the birth of Jesus Christ because it's such a powerful event, the incarnation and the birth of Christ. But what's more important, we should allow Jesus to be born in our hearts every day, every single day in prayer. And remember that Jesus Christ being born in a manger should remind us to prepare some room for Jesus in our hearts, in our minds, in our homes, and in our souls. And it's time that all of us repent personally and nationally because we've all fall we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. That's right. And let's not forget the, the great first responder verse, Matthew five nine. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Make sure that you're a peacemaker, especially right now uh, and during the octave of Christmas. Ruben? That's right, Jess. We could affect so many people, not only in our families, but in the communities we serve, in our parishes. We have to be that light that, that goes out into the world, and uh, we can only do it through prayer. And, and you know, in, in, many, in some cases, prayer and fasting. And we have to be... The, we have to be leaders. This is, is not, we can't sit back and just and watch, be a spectator. This is not a spectator sport, Jesse. We're not, can't sit on the, exactly. Can't sit, he's not a spectator. No, we can't sit on the sidelines. You know, we got to, you know, amateur hour is over. Time to get, get involved. Amateur hour. <laughs> Jesse, we. Hey, hey, don't forget to your year end check for Stations of the Cross. Okay. Stations of the Cross is, is, uh, is feeding the body of Christ in many parts over in the East Coast. Um, and even through the internet, potentially everywhere. So let's uh, let's uh, act like family. And let's help stock the refrigerator that feeds a lot of people. And that refrigerator station of the Cross Radio. How do you stock the refrigerator? Write them a nice check. Okay, the economy's good. Don't say, oh, things are bad. No, they're not. Uh, things haven't been this good in 50 years. Okay, be generous. Uh, Generosity is a virtue. And remember that uh, Jesus Christ, uh, he says, uh, he, he tells us, that whatever you give him, he will give you back tenfold. That's right. You can't. Ruben? I'll, you can't. I'll give Jesus. There's no way. And, and and you know, Jess, thank you for having me on the on the show today. It was a pleasure. It was an honor to fill yeah, in thanks, for Terry. Ruben, thanks for. You're yeah. always welcome to 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 come in and stand in for either one of us. All right. Really appreciate that. That's great. All right. And we want to wish all our uh, our our listeners a, a very happy new year and prosperous and and healthy and spirit lifting uh new year so that uh we can and there's there's anita we say Here's hello my wife next to me for those okay. of you that are on social media with her with her new year's crown there hey happy man new year happy new year anita <laughs> love you all right <laughs> jesse what what state should we be living in hey let's live in a state of grace especially during the, the octave of christmas and new year's and don't live in a state of mortal sin and uh and let's remember uh, let's all get holy or die trying. Amen. Ruben, thanks a lot for subbing, brother. God bless you and your family. God bless, bless you. you. Okay, take care. All right. God bless. And don't forget, write a nice check to Stations of the Cross Radio. Your end check. Instead of giving it all to Uncle Sam, how about writing it to Stations of the Cross Radio? Stock the refrigerator that feeds many people out in the East Coast. And uh, God bless you. Keep the faith. Amen. Viva Cristo Rey. Viva Cristo Rey. Saint Faustina's Prayer for Priests. Oh my Jesus. I beg thee on behalf of the whole church, grant it love and the light of thy spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great high priest, may the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. 
for thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin most powerful, pray for us.